Most weeks, I will give one example in the video and ask you to apply the same skills to a different data set. But for this first assignment, I'm going to walk you through the assignment exactly. Well, almost exactly. There are a few questions in the assignment that are up to you, but for the most part, you can follow along. And if you do things on your end as I am doing them in the video, pausing as often as you need to, you will be mostly done with the assignment in no time. So let's start by getting the files you need. First, in iLearn, go to the Analysis Assignment Working in R section, and you will find there three files, as you see right here. There's a CSV, a TXT, and a PDF file. Download all three of those and open up the PDF file. And if your browser doesn't ask you where you want to put the files, but puts it somewhere generic, then before you go any further, please, for your own sanity, go ahead and move those files into a folder that makes sense to you. If you don't have a logical organizational schema already, it's really time to develop one. I'll give you a for instance, although you do not need to have something nearly as complex as what I have. Something far simpler will work. But if you look up at my folder that I have on the screen here, you'll see that we are within my documents folder, and then I have a folder called teaching, and then within that a folder for classes that I have taught, and then within that a folder for classes that I've taught at Tennessee Tech. And we're in that folder and you can see that right now I've only got this one current class, but if we click on that, within that I have a few other subfolders. I put everything for this one in a handouts folder. You will probably have something different like assignments, but in handouts, we can see down here, there's the file for the instructions. And then I have my other files in this subfolder here, where I have things that I need for the different assignments. So you don't have to have something this complex. You can put them all in one folder. But whatever you do, get it organized and make sure it's a folder that's dedicated to this class at least, and where you can easily find it. Because that's going to be very important in the first thing we do once we open up our studio. All right, and once you have all of that situated, go ahead and fire up RStudio. And the first thing you're gonna do once you get RStudio open is open up a new script file. And there are two ways that you can do this, and I'm gonna show you both of those ways. Option one is you come up here to the top and you click on File, New File, and then the very first thing that comes up is an R script, and you can click on that. The other option, Immediately below that, you'll see this little icon that looks like a plus sign in a green circle with a little white blank page. That's also new file. Click on that, and the first thing is our script. And actually, if you're paying attention, there's a third way you can do it. You can do the control shift in, and that will also open up a script file. All of your work should be done in this script file. Do not enter anything directly into the console you need to put it on the script file. And before we go further, go ahead and save this so that you've got the file already set up. And you can click on the little save icon at the top here, and it will ask you to navigate into whatever folder you need. And so I want you to call this AA1 dash, and then whatever your last name is. So in my case, I would put Trivet and then dot R. So make sure you have that whole thing here, but just replace my last name with your last name, and then go ahead and save it. And you'll see it shows up here at the top, and then anytime you are ready to save, you can just hit save, and it will make sure to keep your work constantly updated so you don't lose everything if, you know, the power goes out or something like that. The first part of your script file should always contain three things. A brief title and header should be first, and the header should include a brief description of what the file is about, and also include your name, and it's a good idea to include the date you started the file. The second thing you need is a command line to set the working directory. Alternatively, I sometimes create an object containing the file path that I want to use, and I reference that. This is especially helpful if you are using remote drives or if your source files are in a different folder from where you want to save your output. One thing I want to note real quick, the working directory that I have put here is an example so that it will fit on the screen, but I actually am setting my working directory somewhere else. Don't worry about that. 
And then third, you need a line of commands to load your needed libraries. So, go ahead and run the two lines of code. I showed you how to do this last week by highlighting and hitting run or pressing control enter on your keyboard. You could also make sure that the cursor is on the line of interest and do the same thing. R will run one complete line at a time this way. And once you've done this, if you look down at the console screen, you should see something similar to what I have on mine, and that'll let you know that it ran correctly. Before we go any further, let's talk about comments. In R, the pound sign or hashtag this symbol right here means comment, and R will ignore anything that follows this on a line. In fact, out of 11 example lines, only two contain actual code. The rest are either blank or commented out. There are three things I want you to take away from this example and start applying to your own code. First, use comments liberally. They help others, and sometimes even future you, understand what you're trying to do. It doesn't matter how many of these symbols you use on a line. You may notice that the first few lines start with three of them, but the later one's only one. To R, these are the same. But notice how that difference helps the human eye more easily follow things. My usual practice is to use three of them for top matter and section headers and to use two or one for smaller components. But do what feels right to you. And third, a comment can come after the code that you want to run. If you look on the set working directory line, my code sets the working directory and then has a line reminding you to swap out the file path. Normally, I wouldn't put that here, but I wanted to illustrate this other use case. Usually, having comments on the same line as code can make things harder to read, but every now and then it is useful and I expect you may occasionally find such uses in your own work. Now, in the assignment instructions, your first question asks you to explore something about comments. Remember that your working directory is what R is able to look at, but you have to tell R about the specific files you want to use. Today, we're going to bring in two files, a data object and a script. Add two lines of code as you see here, and run them. And once you run it, you should see two objects appear. The first is a data object called farms, and the second is a function called birthday. And we're going to be playing with both of these in the next task, but I want to point out a few things about the farms line in your code. Remember that you are learning a programming language. And if we were to translate this line of code into English, it basically says, read in the CSV file called aa1.csv and store it into a data object called farms. This symbol can be loosely interpreted as store into. It even sort of looks like an arrow, as if you're graphically telling R to take the material on the right and put it into the thing on the left. We will use this symbol so much, there is even a keyboard shortcut for it. If you hold down the Alt button and press the Dash button, typically between the zero and the equal sign on a standard keyboard, R will place that symbol into your code for you. Once you get used to that, it's a lot faster than typing the less than and dash. Now we have two commands in this code chunk. And you can think of commands as sort of like verbs in regular speech. The typical format for a command is command parenthesis, where command is whatever the actual command or function is, read.csv, or source, or setwd, or library. And the material in the parentheses gives some needed arguments. We might think of the arguments as nouns and adjectives. So far, we have only seen commands that require a single line of text in quotes, but different commands require different things, and some can get quite complex. We'll see a different example of what can go into a command in the next task. Last thing before jumping into that task, 
the farms object needs slight modification. And it's a good chance to teach you one more command and one last special symbol. First, the command. Add this line of text to your script file, which will give you the column names of an object. Note that this time you don't add quotes. That's because you're referencing an object currently in R's environment. I know remembering when to use quotes and when not to can be a bit confusing at first. In time, you'll get the hang of when you need them and when you don't. And if you want to see what happens when you use them incorrectly, go add quotes around farms and see what happens when you run that line again. Don't worry, you won't break anything. Then take them back out so the script runs correctly. Also, don't skip this part. It is the second question that you should answer. And this brings us to the pipe operator, which looks like this. The pipe operator allows us to take everything on the left side and pipe it through to whatever comes on the right or in the next line. As you develop your coding skills, the pipe operator is likely to become one of your best friends. And you can even use it multiple times in a row. But for now, we'll get used to just using it once. Add the following lines into your script. Translate it into English. These lines say, take the farm's object and rename column number one as year, then store it back into the farm's data object. By the way, the keyboard shortcut for the pipe operator is control M. If you now rerun the call names command, you'll see the oddity has been corrected. Don't type it again, just go back up to line 17 and rerun it. That's one of the beauties of a script file. Let's move on to the birthday function. Type out this command, but modify it to include your own birth date. For instance, I was born on September 12, 1980, so I would type in birthday, parenthesis, 9, 12, 1980, close parenthesis, using appropriate numbers for each part of the date in month, day, year format. Once you've typed out the command with your own birth date, run it, and something will be printed to the console. See question three in your instructions. Here is a command, technically a function, that requires multiple arguments. If you peek under the hood, birthday has three required arguments, M, D, and Y, which must be either specified in that order or be explicitly labeled when you call that function. To see what I mean, check out some of the examples I list in the instruction file, and be aware that some are intentionally incorrect. Feel free to try others too. It will help you better understand R. Then question four asks you to explain what you learned from this sandboxing. Now let's explore the farms object, which lists data about farms in America during the 20th century. We'll start by peeking at the data, which is reasonable to do with a small data object like this, but may not be so reasonable for objects with thousands of records or more. There are a few ways to do this. Line 25 and line 26 show this. You could just type farms, or you could type view parenthesis farms. Try each one and see what happens. When you do, you will see that there are five columns in this object, which corresponds to the five variables indicated in the environment pane. And the first of them is year, which runs at decade intervals. Next is the number of farms in America in that year, followed by the total number of acres in cultivation for a given year. And you can use this as a foundation to answer question five. Now let's consider some questions that we might ask about the data and how we'd use R to answer those questions. For example, what was the average American farm size across the 20th century? There are two different things you can try, listed here on lines 29 through 31. You could type mean, which is a form of an average, parenthesis, farms, dollar sign, farms, in parenthesis. Or you could try 
farms, pipe operator, summarize, parenthesis, mean, parenthesis, farms. And pay attention to what's capitalized and what isn't because R is case sensitive. Let's try both of those things and see what happens. The first one gives us a value of 4,425,846. And the second one, would you look at that, gives us the exact same value. So two different ways that we might accomplish the same task. Let's try another question. What year saw the most acreage in cultivation? And again, there are two ways to do it. The first way is a little bit clunky, but it will work. I won't read it out loud, but you can see the entire text listed there on line 34. What this is saying is, look at the farm's object and the vector year, but given a condition that's in brackets, that the vector acres in farms is equal to the maximum value of the vector acres in farms. It's a little bit convoluted, don't you think? In this case, I actually recommend the second way as it is much more streamlined and as we'll see later would allow you to do things further down the line if you had further calculations to do. Lines 36 through 37 effectively say, take farms and filter it on acres by the maximum value in acres. That's a lot easier to understand, isn't it? Also, I want you to note in both of these scenarios, the double equal sign. The double equal sign in R means is equal to. Try either of these with only one equal sign and you'll get an error. And if you want to see what that error looks like, just delete one of the equal signs and run it. Just make sure you put it back so it runs correctly. It's an easy mistake to make, and typos like that will likely account for at least three quarters of your coding errors, especially while you are learning. So try not to get too stressed out about it, but just remember, is equal to should have two equal signs. Here's one more question. What year saw the fewest tractors in use? Again, there are two ways to do this, but I'm only going to show you one because I think at this point you're getting the idea. If you try something like lines 40 to 41, farms piped into filter where tractors is equal to the minimum value in tractors, you will get an answer for that. Now, for question six, I'm going to ask you to extrapolate from the examples that I've given you here to answer a few other questions about this data object. You won't be able to directly copy and paste what I've done to get the right answer. You'll need to use certain pieces in new combinations. Some of you may find this a bit frustrating, but it's also a foundational skill set in learning to code. When you get to your own projects, I can help you, but I won't be able to simply tell you what to do. So it's better to figure this stuff out now. As such, while you could answer all of question six by just peeking at the table, you will only get credit if I see code that would have answered it. By the time we get to data objects with several hundred or even several thousand rows, the by hand approach just isn't feasible. Let me give you a few more pointers that should help. First, when you use a filter command, the left side of the double equals must be the vector of interest to filter on. The right side can be almost anything. The examples I've given you use other commands on some variable, but you could also put a static value such as 1980. Second, as you might guess, other logical operators can also be used besides the double equals. You could use greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, and even not equal to. There are others we'll learn later, but that's more than you will need for now. Finally, if you want to filter on multiple conditions, you can use conjunctions. Yes, just like in regular language. If you want to say, and also, use the ampersand. If you want to say, or, use the bar. 
This is the key just above the enter button on a standard PC keyboard. For example, filter on year is equal to 1980 and farms are greater than 100. Try that out, see how that helps. Finally, let's try graphing the data object. We'll talk more about creating graphs later. That probably deserves its own video. But if you've made it this far, you deserve to be rewarded with a pretty picture and to not have to think too hard about how that picture was created. Though I would encourage you to take some time to puzzle over the code and see if you can figure out what's what. We'll get there eventually, but again, there's a lot to be learned by simply trying to dissect it yourself. When you run this code, which I have also included in the instructions on iLearn, you should get something similar to this. Then for question seven, take a stab at interpreting what you see. As you get into your projects, you'll likely want to work on it for a bit, then close things out and come back to it another time to keep working. While a good script file would let you just start from scratch each time, as things get large and complicated, even that can waste a lot of time. It's better to save your objects as you go, and don't forget to save your script file too. And even better is to save it as an R data object, which has the .rda extension, like you see here on line 58. You could change what's in the quotes to anything you wanted, really, but I suggest file names that are intuitively obvious. Occasionally, you may also need to export a file for use outside of R. There are lots of file extensions that R can convert to, but the most useful, in part because of its near universality, is the CSV file which stands for Comma Separated Value Files. If you saved the script file and ran the last code chunk properly, you already have two files ready to submit. The third file you need is the one with your answers to the seven questions that I've asked, and you may submit a Word file or a PDF. Please include your name in the document and label the file as instructed. Next time around, we'll build on these skills and start adding basic univariate statistics, in the meantime, feel free to go soak your head in a bowl of cold water if you're feeling a little overworked.